Okay, it's very nice to be here. So, uh, a few uh, technical things. I don't have a watch, so you tell me, and I can talk 10 hours. So be careful. <laughs> so stop me for coffee, because we need all the uh, coffee at a certain time. And uh, the other point that I want to emphasize, I'm a teacher, and if you don't ask questions, it's useless. So stop me whenever you want to ask a question or you don't uh, do something that will make it more lively. And uh, the third point I want to, to make that I summarized the three lectures in uh, PDF text, which will be available. So I won't be able to say everything, uh, never are able to say, but there'll be uh, three PDF for each day there is a PDF uh, lecture notes, and which you can hope for. Uh, they're available, so we'll make them available uh, to everybody, and you can download them. If you want to print, you can print. If you want, if you like to read them on the screen, you can. Probably it's better to sit paper to do that. <coughs> okay, so this is my uh, technical things that I want to start with. So. Uh, what I want to talk about today is the emergence of the laws of thermodynamics from quantum mechanics as a general introduction to the field of uh, quantum thermodynamics. And this is, uh, you could say, this idea of uh, here, this nano is an important uh, question in what I want to uh, present or what's going to be presented here. So when we think about thermodynamics, we think about big engines, steam engines, cars, something like that. And so when we go small, the question is how far can we push things? So we make them smaller and smaller and smaller. And technologically, you can say one of the big challenge is to make a small refrigerator. Because what's limiting our cellular phone now is basically the heat generator. That's one of the reasons it's hard to make them stronger and bigger, because we need a mini refrigerator. But even smaller, the question is how far can you push it so you we'll make things smaller and smaller and reach the quantum level, and that's the subject here. And then <coughs> we want to know the principles of, that's where quantum thermodynamics <laughs> comes, to show that we can push it all the way down to single quantum system and these devices are being built. So maybe before we start, there are recent experiments. There is an experiment that was done by Schmidt Kaller who built an auto engine from a single eye. This is uh, published. There is, a, I think, pending for publication, a refrigerator built out of three ions in an ion trap, quantum refrigerator. So this is already the emergence of what I'm talking about is just not basic, only basic science, which is what I like, but it only has, also has some uh, uh, practical applications. I know practical, but experimental realizations, not uh, to say it like that. Okay, so where do we start? So this is where we start, We're talking about basic science. So. This uh, paper from Einstein, 1905, this is uh, where the field starts. And <coughs> in a way, this is where quantum mechanics starts. Now, I'm, I'm sure that when you go to a basic course in quantum mechanics, this paper is mentioned, but I think nobody really reads it carefully. So I want to just show you a few extracts from an English translation of this is written originally in German which tries to put what was really meant by Einstein when he wrote this paper. So you can say heuristic point of view concerning the production and transformation of light. This is uh, this 1905 paper. And if you read it and you try to look at it, it's all the arguments are based on thermodynamics or in thermodynamics and statistical mechanics. And what Einstein does in this paper, he 
looks and tries to calculate the entropy of light inside the cavity. This is what he does, and this is the expression that you get. So he says this equ equation shows that the entropy of a monochromatic radiation sufficiently low density varies with the volume according to the same law as the entropy of an ideal gas of dilute solutions. So this here, this is the expression for the entropy of light inside the cavity. And if you just read it, you say, this doesn't mean much. But what it really means, that light is particles. And the way Einstein thinks, it says, OK, if the entropy is the same, light should behave as particles. Because it has the right scaling. So you can say, it, it, when he starts the paper, he talks about electromagnetic radiation as a global phenomenon, but when he does a calculation of the entropy, he reaches to this conclusion that light is particles. And then, <coughs> here, he, he, this is, uh, goes on in this paper, monochromatic radiation of low density within the range of validity of Wyman's radiation formula behaves thermodynamically as if it consists of mutually independent energy quantum of magnitude, okay, uh, Planck's constant is hidden inside uh, these expressions here. So it's not our, what we use as model. So if, what, what do I, why do I point this out? But the way of thinking of Einstein was Thermodynamic is a theory that's going to stay with us. If you go what he talked about it later. So he says, this is where I'm going to start. And any other theory is trying to compare two theories, electromagnetism and thermodynamics. They have to be consistent. Out of this consistency theory, he reached this, uh, you could say, this formula that all of you use and love, that the energy is proportional to the frequency. Now, <clears throat> so the consistency with thermodynamics is what leads Einstein to this conclusion. And what people wrongly interpret this is Einstein trying to explain the photoelectric effect, which just to give this is the photoelectric effect. Here's this linear dependence of the energy of the electron that's emitted as a function of energy. And here, this is a paper from 1940. So this is nine years after Einstein wrote his paper. The photoelectric effect is proven by uh, Millikan, uh, a direct determination of age. This is how this paper is called. Now, why do people misinterpret that? Because we tend to think that a scientist tries to explain something. He sees a phenomenon and tries to rationalize it. It wasn't Einstein's way of thinking. Einstein's way of thinking wants to think globally, can, to try to have a consistent theory. And out of that, he, so he concludes and gets to this uh, uh, relation that light is particles, and there is a relation between the energy and the frequency. And <coughs> so this I'll use kind of as a motto, and I'll use it in an opposite way when we go on, but at the last part of the paper, Einstein tries to think, okay, this is very radical. Is it fit what's known experimental in this period? And he has some explanations of some early measurements of Leonard and, uh, and uh, uh, I forgot, Stokes and some others which there are some indications that there is that light that's higher frequency is more energetic in some way. But it's, there is no measurement that he's trying to explain there. It's, it's more an illustration that he's, what this radical theory is consistent with what people knew at the time. But there's no quantitative theory, the uh, experiment that Einstein tries to explain. So I think this is a, an important kind of lesson at least was for me, that's why I start from that, to <coughs> try to introduce a new uh, kind of theory. And now, what I'm going to go from here is the opposite. So we're more than 100 years later, and we 
quantum mechanics is, I would say, taught in a much more serious way than thermodynamics. Uh, maybe in an engineering institute, people know, still know thermodynamics. But at least for most scientists, they get a few courses in quantum mechanics, and that's more established from uh, their point of view than thermodynamics. So what I'll try to do is do the opposite. I'll start from quantum mechanics. By now, we believe that quantum mechanics is a correct and consistent theory. And try to find the quantum analogies of the laws of thermodynamics. So we'll try to go the opposite direction. Axiomatically, we assume that quantum mechanics is correct. I'll use standard, I would say, von Neumann point of quantum mechanics, and we'll try to see if we can be consistent, and then we'll get a, a theory of, which is a consistent theory of quantum uh, thermodynamics that emerges from quantum mechanics, and as you'll see, it works, in the sense that we could do this uh, opposite direction that, than the direction that Einstein did, which means that in a way, you can go both ways. So this is uh, what I want to um, kind of cover today, the emergence of these laws, and we'll continue from here. So <clears throat> this is just, before I go deeply, just a very simple illustration of uh, ideas that come from uh, quantum thermodynamics. And this is uh, an important paper in this field a paper that's been written by uh, Scoville and basically other people joined, but the main uh, person here is, is Scoville. It's 1959, so it's PRL number two. So it just started to split from physical review uh, PRL. Now, uh, I'm holding a laser, and Scoville is one of the developers of solid state lasers. He was in Bell Labs, and Doing, you could say, if you look at patents of solid state lasers, you will see that the Scoville is there. But he also wanted to think about fundamental issues. And then he came up with this idea that a three level laser is equivalent to a heat engine. So this is, in, now this is in a way so simple to analyze. And I'll go through this uh, a little bit slowly. That We'll use this as a motivation, then we'll go back to this uh, maybe later. So what do we have here? Okay, so here I have Carnot. I used to have a picture of Scoville, so don't have it in this slide, but never mind. So what do we have in a heat engine? I have a hot bath, I have a cold bath, and in between I have three levels. So it's a three-level laser. So, And let's see how uh, this can work. So here's a ground state, my lowest label, and here's this excited state, and this is coupled to the hot bed. So how is it done through a filter or something? I'm not going to go into the details how to realize that, but this has equilibrium between these two energy levels. So here I have an energy level, and here I have an energy level, and then I can, what I'll do, I'll do analysis just by population, and I can ask how much population I have up here. So you can see the ratio between the population, the ground state, and the excited state is just Boltzmann factor. H bar omega of this frequency divided by kT. So this gives me the ratio of population here. Now the same thing here. This, these two levels are coupled to the cold bath. So I look at it. So I get the ratio of the population here and here. It's again just Boltzmann factor. And now what do we know about lasers? They work about on population inversion. So I need higher population here than here. So then if I'll come with radiation and I'll have population inversion, I'll get amplification. So <coughs> you can, if we look at that, this is the gain, the difference in population between here and here. And for the laser to work, we need this to be larger than zero. And now, what's the efficiency of this device? If we look at this, so the efficiency, this is what I put in. 
This is my input. I have to pump energy, put it out here. And what they get out is, as radiation is this frequency. So the efficiency of this device, which I'm holding here, you can say is the at least limited by this frequency divided by my input, which is this quant. So if I think about that, I have to pump a quant here. I get a quant here. So this would be the efficiency. And I can also write it like that, omega h minus omega c divided by omega h. So this would be my efficiency. So now <coughs> we have a definition of efficiency. We have this notion of gain, population inversion. And if I take this inequality, I can get out of this immediately this inequality like that. Was, I changed the sign. Why? Because NH and NC are monotonic functions of the expressions here, H bar omega what's here. So if I, I can get rid of this exponent, I have a minus sign here, so I reverse my inequality. I get this inequality out of this positive gain condition. I move it a little bit, I get that the ratio of frequencies has to be smaller than the ratio of temperatures. This is in order to get population inversion. I stick this in this equation. I get that the efficiency of this device is 1 minus omega c divided by omega h. You get it from here. And this has to be smaller than the Carnot efficiency. So <coughs> when is it equal? At 0 gain. Then we get the quality here. So it means that a three-level laser is at least thermodynamically equivalent to at least from the point of view of efficiency, and if you think about it from the point of view of uh, also entropy generation and other uh, considerations, this is equivalent to a Carnot engine. So already we have our, you see I'm holding in my hand a Carnot engine, so we miniaturized it uh, quite a lot. And you can see what you need here is really minimum. So this paper, okay, I'll go one step further. So we have, you see, the, the, both the experiment and a very simple theor theory. You can say it's oversimplified, but then I'll go back to that. And then let's do a trick. I'll just reverse it. So we know that an engine and a refrigerator are the same thing. So what I, all what I did, I took this, everything is the same. I just reversed the directions. So I'm taking radiation in. So I'm pumping from here to here by radiation. I'm equilibrating here in the hot bath in this direction. So I'm pumping heat out of my cold bath. So what is that? That's a refrigerator. I'm pumping heat from a cold bath to a hot bath on the expense of radiation. So how would you call that? You would call that laser cooling. And basically the same theory that I had before it works. I can, for a refrigerator, we have the coefficient of performance. It means how much heat I get out with respect to the quantum of energy I put in. So this is called the COP. So if, we're look, if I want to go and buy an air conditioning unit in, for your house or something like that, what you should look at is a COP. But usually what you, people sell you now is about between two and three, some number like that. But this is what you want. So in this case, the gain has to be opposite. We want more population here than here so we can pump it. And the same arguments that I used here, these Boltzmann factors to get the population also hold in this case. So the inequality just changed sign. So you can say, you can ask the question, what's the minimum temperature I can get out of that? And that's determined by this frequency ratio and the hot temperature. So this is the minimum temperature I want to cool out of my cold bath. And where people use laser cooling, you can say that the COP is basically this ratio uh, between the cold bath temperature and the hot bath temperature. Or you could use directly the frequencies. So now let's again make this a little bit uh, 
more towards uh, what laser cooling has de developed to. So this is the uh, paper that suggested laser cooling, or what people refer to is this uh, uh, paper by Wineland, which got the Nobel Prize not for this, for other things. It probably should have deserved it also for this. So this is a suggestion for uh, the, what's called Doppler cooling, and another paper came at the same time, 1975, by Hansch Hensch, which also got the Nobel Prize for another reason. So these are what's considered in the literature as the uh, founders of laser cooling. So what you do is laser cooling. You want to cool a gas, that's a rubidium atoms, to uh, ultra-cold temperatures. So these two levels here would be hyperfine, and this would be an optical transition. And immediately it tells you how cold can you get that. So if you take this, it would be, a, let's say, megahertz, and this is uh, frequencies of room temperature, you get that the uh, COP is about 10,000, something like that, 1 to 10,000, the ratio of uh, frequencies. And this tells you how what, what, what to expect of a temperature that you can get in laser cooling without elaborating on Doppler cooling and all kinds of mechanisms. Very simple thermodynamic analysis already tells you what's the ballpark that uh, you can expect. And if you want to cool more, I'll reach to that. You, in a way, you can cool uh, with this. As a first analysis to know what is temperatures to expect in laser cooling, this is good enough. And what it tells you that this frequency you want as small as possible, and this frequency you want as big as possible. So that's why you work from hyperfine, which is basically magnetic splitting in the ground state of, of the atom in this case. And this would be an optical transition, which is very high frequency. So if you can do that, design a laser that you shine at something that takes it from pumps only from here up to here and goes down here. Then you have a refrigerator. And this principle now is used, for example, in uh, uh, NV centers and diamonds. It's exactly the same idea. It's a three level, or three or four level refrigerator. And people don't call that a refrigerator. They call, it, they call it optical pumping. But in a way, it's completely equivalent to optical pumping and are announced. Just uh, one more note about this, that I don't know why I ha don't have it on, on this slide, but going back to, to Scoville, Scoville realized that if he has a heat engine, he has a refrigerator. So in a way, if we want to really be historically just, Scoville invented laser cooling. And he has papers on that, and he talks about it explicitly. And this I would say is another lesson about science why you want to talk to people. Because you couldn't say that Scoville didn't publish in important journals. He published in PRL and Physical Review or something like that. But Wineland didn't know about that. And Scoville even has an experimental paper about uh, using a maser to cool, 1969, five years before uh, Wineland. Wineland in invented this completely independently. You can say both are in physics. You couldn't say that they're in, in marginalized places. And still, by not meeting each other, not even having a discussion, Wineland reinvented, you could say, laser cooling, something that was in the literature, published in the best journals. And it's just to maybe to show why it's important to come here, talk. Maybe you don't understand everything, but ask questions. That's always good. So, <clears throat> and let's say these are. Uh, this, uh, is TC, you mean it can also be a laser? What? This heat reserve of the coal plant. We're here? Yeah. So if this is a laser? So, do we need. This is not. Okay, so if, we, if we, we'll go to. This is. Doesn't, it's not coherent at all. Mm -hmm. So, this is a heat. So, this transition, you can say, is stochastic. It should be always. It doesn't have to be. If you, if you, if you, you can make it not stochastic, but then you'll have to use a more elaborate theory because you have to take coherence into consideration, which makes this is 
makes things much more, uh, on the one hand, complicated. But then this comes to, I would say, what people are debating today. <laughs> and what, what is the issue is really how to define work and how to define uh, heat in a nano device or in a... Here, when you put it like that, I would say this is an, in a way a flat description because everything is stochastic. Everything is population. So this will fit what nowadays you will call stochastic thermodynamics. If I have, I just analyze a population and I get my result. But we know that quantum mechanics has additional features which are not, that's why we have to go beyond. Otherwise you would say, okay, they did all the work in 1959, why should we do it? Go back to that. The other thing is, if you don't have the cold back, then you have nothing to cool. And you wouldn't call it laser cooling. And you, you would have nothing to cool, and you have to close the cycle. Yes, actually, you have this DC, it's the cold back, and you replace it with a hot back, and that's how you achieve the cooling. Yeah, so I need both sides. Yes. So you say, I pump from here and pour it into the hot back. Yeah. Can certainly be replaced by a laser, but you would not call it refrigerator. Yes. Okay, so where are we going to go uh, from here? Where I want to go from here, and I hope I can use uh, there because I, I want to go, as I said, from uh, quantum mechanics into thermodynamics, and what we need is basically analogs coming from quantum mechanics of the laws of thermodynamics. And this is kind of will summarize what I'll again say in, uh, more explicitly. We can think what, to, what we want or what to expect. So here's our device. Here is, a, let's say, a cold bath. And I put radiation. So if we think about it, if I have a source of radiation and I have my system here and I go somewhere to, my, to the environment, I expect to direction of energy flow like that, from the radiation through my system to the back. And if I get something opposite, it's impossible. This is what we expect from thermodynamics. I can't take cool the water of the sea and get energy out of that. This is say the, one of the versions of the second law. So uh, I can't expect this direction. So we want to build a theory that will always work like that. I take radiation, it becomes dissipated and becomes heat. Another example, what we want, we want a hot bath and a cold bath and it flows through our device. Again, we know that heat will always flow from hot to and we don't expect this to go the opposite way if we don't pump it. So again, this is what we expect from thermodynamics, and we should see this in the theory that we're going to develop. And making it more complicated here, I added radiation. Now in this case, I'm pumping. So I can go in the opposite direction, but I need a third lead. Let's say here's my thermal transi transistor. I go like that. And so here I have already some form of nonlinear device that allows me to pump heat in the opposite direction. So this is, and you could say, what we expect from our theory to uh, behave in this uh, manner. And we want to base it on uh, uh, quantum uh, mechanics. So, uh, now, I hope this will work. I need some uh, basic, uh, basic theory, which is very basic. So if somebody knows it, I apologize. And, but otherwise, we won't have a common uh, language here uh, to continue. So I need from you to uh, a common language that we can continue our uh, description. 
So what I need, since I'm starting from quantum mechanics, I'm going to give a very brief uh, version of uh, quantum mechanics, which is due to uh, von Neumann. And this is I'm going to use. And if you uh, understand this, I hope you can understand uh, everything. So what do we have? This doesn't work. Yeah. You see? This is my system. And what I need is a theory that's called a theory of open quantum systems. The th my system is not alone in the world. I have a bath around. So this is what we need for our uh, world. But let's start from our system. So what does quantum mechanics need as, you can say, axiomatic ingredients? It has to have, first of all, a description of the state of the system. So, I'm going to use this. Von Neumann taught us that the only consistent description of a state comes through an operator that we call density operator. Which, if it's a pure state, we write it in Dirac notation like that. If it's a pure state. But here there's a point that's written in, in von Neumann's book, and it took the physicist, I would say, 50 years to understand von Neumann, but he writes it explicitly in English. But the thing is, physicists went after Dirac and not after von Neumann, and now we're going back to von Neumann, in a way. So what did von Neumann say? But because this idea of a density operator, for example, Landau took it from statistical mechanics. He wanted something that describes some statistical distribution of events that we don't know for certain reasons we have uncertainty in something, and we want to describe it as a probability. So since this we're talking about quantum mechanics, it's a probability density that's described by an operator. And so <coughs> what von Neumann understood that in quantum mechanics, if I give you my state S, and I tell you, listen, this is the density operator of my state S, 